Now is the time to shape your stories. Your fate is in your hands. <laughs> Am I right, Marie? Sir, yes, sir! Well, we are in week three of this series called Level Up, and we are using this video game imagery because in video games, there's sort of these moments where you get stronger, run faster, jump higher, the race car jumps over things, just kind of, you level up, level up, and in, in a walk with Jesus, this is something God wants for us. He wants us continually growing in our passion, our heart for him, our love for others, our ability to share his love with the world. Because the reality is this, when you become a follower of Jesus, when you come to that place where you come to the cross, you meet Jesus Christ, and you realize that he's God who left heaven, who entered human history, who lived a perfect life with no sin, but he died on the cross for our sins in our place. He paid the price, and three days later, he rose again. And when you come to that place where you've received that forgiveness and that grace, you've confessed your sins, you become a Christian. You want other people to know that God loves them too, that his grace is enough for them too, that he can take away their guilt and their shame. He can restore their lives. And, and when you know Jesus, you want other people to know him too. But, but we talk around here, we talk about organic outreach. We don't want to shove it down people's throats. We don't want to force it on people. We want to naturally, organically share the love of Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about this idea of leveling up. So two weeks ago, we talked about leveling up our passion for outreach, just our passion to, to share God's love. And we talked about opening four things. We talked about that happens as we open our eyes to see people as Jesus sees them, as we open our hearts to love people with the love of God, as we open up our schedules to make time to interact with people, to be with people. And then the toughest thing of all, as we open our mouths to talk about Jesus, to tell our story of what he's doing in our lives, to tell his story of Jesus coming, his life, his death, his resurrection. And as we do those things, our outreach passion goes up, our temperature goes up. If, you know, if you're a one, you, you become a two. If you're a two, you become a three. Say, God, raise my temperature. Open my eyes, my heart, my schedule, my mouth to share the love of Jesus. And then last week, we talked about leveling up our love for people. How do we raise our love for people? And we said the best way to learn to do anything is just to watch Jesus. So last week we looked at John chapter 3, the gospel of John chapter 3, and the gospel of John chapter 4. And those two chapters, kind of almost, almost side by side in the Bible, are these two stories. One is about Nicodemus, a man who came to Jesus at night, and this man, Nicodemus, was educated, powerful, wealthy, religious, but empty on the inside. And he came and found Jesus. And Jesus said, you need to be born again. And he was born again. He became a follower of Jesus. And then in chapter 4, we meet someone very different than Nicodemus. It's a woman who Jesus meets in the middle of the day. And she's poor, she's outcast, she's forgotten, she's kind of a half-breed among her people, and she's an outcast. She's got a broken life. And she becomes a follower of Jesus. And she comes to understand that the Messiah she's waiting for, it's Jesus. She runs into the town, she tells everyone she meets, come and meet this guy Jesus, this man who told me all about myself. And many became followers of Jesus because of her testimony, and even more when they came and met Jesus. So we looked at Nicodemus and the woman at the well, so different. And we learned this, that Jesus wants us to love people from every walk of life, from every experience possible. And we also looked at how Jesus shared with these two people. It was very similar how he shared with, with, with Nicodemus and the woman at the well. He talked with them. He listened to them. He had a conversation. He asked them questions. He heard their hearts. He met them right where they were at, at their point of need. He was provocative in the things he said to them. He challenged them. And he called them to put their faith in him. He called them to a moment of decision. We can learn all those things from these two stories about how we can walk with people. So, so we're saying, God, raise my temperature, warm my heart. We're saying, God, let me love people the way you love people. But let me tell you something. 
We can do our part. We can love people. We can care. We can share. We can serve. We can do all that we want to do. But if the power of God isn't part of it, it's not going to change anybody's life. Because you know what? You didn't die on the cross for anybody, neither did I. And you didn't rise again, neither did I. Jesus did that. So we love, we serve, we care, we share, but here's what we need. We need the power of God and the presence of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to come with what we do to change lives. It's that partnership. And that connection, that partnership comes through prayer. It comes as we pray, as we talk to God, as we ask him to help us and to guide us and to direct us. And so today we're going to talk about leveling up our prayer, but specifically leveling up our prayers for outreach, our prayers for people who are far from Jesus. And how do we raise the temperature of our prayers? And this hit me this morning as I was thinking about this. I was thinking about what would happen. I'm going to share with you five ways to level up your prayers. And if you're a note taker, you can look in your bulletin. There's a place to write some things down. Five ways to level up your prayer life. But this is what struck me this morning. I did the math on this. At Shoreline Church, If everyone who's part of Shoreline this weekend for worship services, who's here in one of our nine different gatherings that happen on our campus in our different settings, tomorrow night, Monday night service, if everyone who's part of our military gatherings, we've got like eight or nine military gatherings around the world that'll watch this online and that'll follow, if all those people, if all the people that couldn't be here this week, but they watch our services online, which is a lot of people, if all of us together would make this commitment that three times a day we'll lift up some kind of prayer, a five, 10, 15 second prayer, a one-minute prayer, whatever it is. Three times a day, we all lifted up a prayer for outreach to happen. Three times a day for the next 30 days. Around a quarter million prayers will be lifted to the God of heaven from people at Shoreline Church in the next 30 days. How cool would that be? Now, I don't think that God just you know, responds to our prayers because of volume. That's not the point. The point is this. Prayer touches the heart of God. And we can do our part and we can love and serve and care, but until the Holy Spirit comes, until God joins us and we're praying and seeking the power of God, until those things come together, lives won't be radically changed. And they will be as we pray and love and serve and speak. So we're going to look at five ways to pray. And what we're going to do during the sermon today is after each of these five ways, after I kind of teach you the different ways to pray, we're going to stop and we're going to pray each of the five times. So for some of you, like at the, when the sermon's going on and the pastor starts to pray, You're ready to leave. You know, you're like putting your shoes back on, you're packing your purse up, whatever, but you're like getting ready to leave. And I'm telling you today, when I start praying, don't pack up and get ready to leave because we're praying five times just to get, just to be ready, okay? We're going to pray and learn and look at God's word. So here we go. First one, first way to pray is this. Number one, praying for yourself. Praying for yourself. Start praying, God, use me, send me, give me boldness. Start praying for yourself. In Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38, And I've read this the last two weeks. This is a great outreach passage. Matthew 9, 35 to 38, we read this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the prayer. God, send out workers into your harvest field. This is the imagery that Jesus uses to talk about people's hearts are open. They're ready to know about Jesus. But it's we, the workers, the Christians, that aren't going out and sharing your love. So pray, God, send us out into the harvest field. You are called to pray, God, send people out to the harvest fields. If you're a follower of Jesus, this should be part of your life. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that won't make sense. But when you become a Christian, if you give your heart to Jesus, you'll begin to pray this way too. So pay attention because if you're open to Jesus, he may have you praying for others before you know it. But but this idea, Lord, send out workers into your harvest field. So pray, God, send people out. But who is the first person you should always pray that God will send out if you're a Christian? Who's the first person you should pray that God will send out? You, me, right? Right? And I, I, I can pray, okay, God, send, Dennis, send Pastor Dennis out. He needs to go share about Jesus. And I should pray that. But first I should pray, Lord, send me out. I, I, I can say, Lord, send. The, I can pray for each of you, and I will. But I want to start by saying, God, send me out. Every day into your mission field. So here's the first prayer. Praying for yourself. And here's the prayer challenge. It's a little one, but it's a big one. Prayer challenge is this. 
Let today be a mission trip. Simple prayer. Let today be a mission trip. When you wake up in the morning, before you get out of bed, before you start going full speed, before you grab your phone and say, who texted me last night? Before you start checking up on your world, before you do any of that, just lay there for a moment and say, God, today, let this day be a mission trip and let me be your missionary. Send me out with the love of Jesus. You know what happens for so many people? They go on a mission trip. And those mission trips are great. We do a lot of them on the shoreline. And they get on a plane or they drive down to Mexico or they get on a plane and fly to Honduras. And man, you get there and you're on a mission. You're like, I'm going to share Jesus. I'm going to pray for people. I'm going to love people. I'm ready. And you're engaged because you're on a mission trip. You know, we, we, we've had people from shoreline I mean, cutting through the jungles of Honduras in a deeper part of the jungles to help build churches and places, ways to serve and do ministry to kids in that part of the world. We've had people hiking in the Himalayas bringing you know, digital-powered, audio, solar-powered Bibles to, people, to an area where less than 1% of the people have ever even heard about Jesus. And you go, man, if I'm there, I'm tuned in, I'm ready, I'm ready to share Jesus, right? Because you're on a mission trip. What if you woke up every morning and said, today, when I go on my campus, I'm a mission trip. I'm on a mission trip, and that's my mission field. Today, when I go to my DLI classes, I'm on a mission trip. Today, as I'm at NPS, as I'm in my workplace, as I'm in my home caring for my kids, as I'm in my neighborhood, as I go to my sports club to work out, God, let this be a mission trip and let me be your missionary. What might God do if we, every one of us actually said to God, today is an adventure to live for you. Open my eyes to see what you want me to do. Open my mouth to speak. Man, that could be powerful. Thousands of people on a mission trip every day. And then when you go on an international mission trip, it's just doing what you do every day somewhere else. But that becomes part of your lifestyle. So the first challenge, Lord, let today be a mission trip. We're going to pray and ask God to help us think about that tomorrow morning when we wake up before we get out of bed. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that every person here will see themselves, every person who's a Christian who's given their heart to you, Jesus, will see themselves as a missionary and every day as a mission trip and every place you put them as a mission field because there are people there that need to know your love. So Lord, let every day be a new, exciting adventure, a new mission trip for you, wherever you put us, whether it's at home raising kids, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's in an educational setting in the military, wherever you put us, Lord, let us be your missionaries right where you put us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Tomorrow morning, think about that. Pray that prayer. You can do one of your three outreach prayers before you get out of bed. Right? Kind of cool. Number two, praying for other Christians and other churches. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says this. And listen to the language. This is God speaking. And God says, if my people who are called by my name, this is bigger than you, it's bigger than Shoreline, this is the people of God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Man, is there a need for healing all over the place, in our communities, in our world, in our nation? But it's God's people joining together and praying, learning that we're not in this alone. You know, there's all kinds of churches around our community and we can just drive right by them and not even notice them. What about if every time we drove by a church, we prayed for them? God, I pray, as I, as I turn the corner from Corral de Tierra onto Highway 68, coming to church in the morning, and I see Cypress Church up on the hill there, the big cross, and I know Ben and Jody. Uh, Joni, ben is the lead pastor. Joni is his wife. They live near us. They're great people. I'm going to pastor a small group with Ben. I pray for that church. You find yourself driving through Seaside, and you see a small little church that maybe has 50 or 70, 70 people there that people just from the neighborhood that walk to that church. Pray, God, bless that church. Use them to shine as your light right where you put them. You're, you're, you're in Carmel or you're in Pacific Grove and there's churches and they may be thriving churches, they may be struggling churches, but pray God, if they are preaching the Bible, if they love Jesus, if they are Christians, will you bless them? Will you fill them? There's a reason we pray for a church every week in our worship service because we're not in this alone. So when you start praying with, uh, praying for other Christians and praying for other churches as you go by them, so here's your prayer challenge. First, more we prayers than I prayers. Pray for us. Pray we prayers. Lord, we ask. And think about the other churches in our community, in our nation, in the world. 
and then pray for other local churches. I'm in a pastor's group I meet with, and meet with every month, and the pastors in this group, we don't get together and like, you know, complain or whine about our churches. We all love our churches. We get together to encourage each other, to inspire each other, to pray for each other. So I was together with this group Friday, two days ago, and I spent time with Rick Duncan, the pastor of, of uh, Carmel Presbyterian Church. And Rick is just a mighty man of God. He's a great leader. I love him. And he's a brother in Christ. We pray for each other. And I rejoice that God's doing great things in that church. And he's actually got about 20 people coming to the Organic Outreach Conference because they want to learn to reach out to more people. And we get to help that church. And the same is true of lots of, you know, all the way on the other side of Salinas, Salinas Valley Community Church. They, they pre-registered 100 people for the Organic Outreach Conference. They want to reach their community. And we get to help them. We get to partner with them. And some people are like, well, wait, wait, those are the other churches around here. They're the competition. I mean, why are you trying to help them? It's like, what? <laughs> They're family. And if every single church in this community is thriving, all praise and glory to Jesus, amen? amen. And we want to help. We want to work together. So, so you <coughs> start praying as you drive by churches. Start praying for other Christians. So I want to pray right now for the churches in our community, and I want to pray for us to begin praying we prayers and thinking about other Christians because we're in this together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all the churches that are part of our community here on the peninsula, in the Salinas Valley, and beyond. These churches that we drive by and sometimes we don't even notice. Lord, will you help us to notice these churches, to pray? Lord, I pray that thousands of prayers will go up for small churches that are just reaching right in their neighborhood, doing great work, that are preaching Jesus. I pray that you'll help us notice other Christians that are struggling and pray for them because they're family to us. Let Shoreline Church be a partner. We pray, along with our brothers and sisters all around our communities, that together we can share the love and the grace of Jesus, that revival will come and a great work of your spirit in, in, on the, on the, in the Salinas Valley and throughout all the Monterey County area. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So you're driving along, you're walking along, you see a church. You start praying for them. You keep your eyes open if you're driving, and you pray, right? God bless them. God lead them. God direct them. Number three, praying with people close to God for people who are far from God. Pray with people who are close to God. Pray with other Christians. Together pray for people that aren't yet followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter one, there's this great picture that's painted for us of God's people together praying. And Acts chapter 1 doesn't get a lot of press. It doesn't get the kind of press that Acts chapter 2 does because Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. I mean, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes on the church. There's revival. 3,000 people give their hearts to Jesus. Miracles are happening. And you go, man, everyone wants, you know, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, birth of the church. But what chapter of the Bible comes before, right before Acts chapter 2? It's Acts chapter one. A smart group. Or Acts chapter 1. And what's happening? And what's happening in Acts chapter 1? Look with me at verse 13. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. What's happening before Pentecost, before the Spirit comes, before the revival breaks out in Jerusalem? What's happening? Prayer. People are praying. They're seeking the face of God. Do you pray with other Christians for the people in your life that you want to see know Jesus? Do you make that a normal part of your life? Praying with those who are close to God for those who are far from God. And here's the, the, the next challenge. Will you start to pray with other Christians for the people you love and care about that don't know Jesus yet? And some of you are like, well, I don't, I don't ever want to really pray out loud with another Christian. That makes me uncomfortable and nervous. I wouldn't even know what to say. Just talk to Jesus. There's power in praying together in community. Some of you go, that makes me nervous. Then get nervous, but pray. <laughs> and say to another Christian, some, you're talking with a Christian, and they're, they're trying to reach out to a friend or a family member, and they're sharing, it's, it's tough, man. They, I'm, they're so hard-hearted, but I'm praying, praying that I'll be able to share God's love with them. At that moment, just look and say, hey, let's, let's pray real quick for that. Can we pray for that? So here's, so here's your prayer challenge. Here's your prayer challenge. Can we stop and pray about that now? Learn that little line. Can we stop and pray about that now? To say, Lord, bring your revival. Bring your work in people's hearts. So you're talking with another Christian, and they're sharing about a need, a struggle. They're sharing about someone they love and care about that doesn't know Jesus. And that moment, you look at them and you say, can we stop 
and pray about that right now. There's just two of you there. There's five or six of you. Can we stop and pray about that right now? It's amazing when Christians start to pray together as part of the rhythm of our lives. And some of you, that's not something you do, but you could learn to do this. So, so last weekend, I was speaking at a conference for business, Christian business leaders in San Francisco. So I was there for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, back here to preach on Sunday. But <clears throat> we had a couple other shoreline pastors that were along for this trip, and, and their wives were along too. So late, uh, I think it was late Thursday night, we took a walk uh, down the hill from where our hotel was and found a little place to have a bite to eat, and we were walking back up. And it was kind of later in the evening as we were walking back up the hill... You, know, you can hear kind of sirens around the city in San Francisco there. And, and we're walking up, and in a couple, of the, a couple of little doorways, there's people living there. There's one guy with like an umbrella kind of tilted sideways, and he's got a couple bags and this is stuff, and he's kind of curled up, and he lives there in the, in the doorway of this building, you know? And we're walking, as we're walking up, we're seeing these things, and we're talking about, man, this is so tough, and you know, you want to do something to help and make a difference. And, and, and so as we're walking along, we get to the top of the hill, and we're kind of up on the hill, and you can kind of oversee a lot of the city. And we just had this conversation about the needs and the brokenness and the hurt of so many people in so many communities. But at that moment in San Francisco there. <clears throat> so we just said to each other, let's stop and pray. This is six of us, these three couples, standing out in the open on the corner, street corner there. And for probably 10 or 15 minutes, we just prayed together for the city, for the people, for God to move and to work. And that was like a sacred moment. Do you do those sorts of things? Do you just say, can we stop right now and pray together. You'll be amazed at what God does as we pray in community. Those who are close to God praying together for those who are far from God. And so I want to pause, and I want to pray that we would have courage to pray with one another, to make this part of the rhythm of our lives, in our homes, with our kids, with our spouses, with our friends, with our roommates, if they're Christians, to pray together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. Give us courage to pray. When we're with other Christians and we're hanging out and laughing and talking and sharing life, let one of the things we do often when we're together is just to say, can we stop and pray right now? Let this become part of our lives because God, power is unleashed in prayer. We think of Acts 1 and what came afterwards, Acts 2, a mighty work of your spirit. Let us be people of prayer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So that's three of the five. So we got two left. Number four, praying for spiritual power, protection, and victory. It is a spiritual battle that we're facing when we try to reach God, people with God's love, and we try to reach out and share the message of Jesus. There's a spiritual battle, so we have to pray for spiritual power, for protection, and for victory. Uh, this last month on the night of worship, our last uh, Wednesday evening service that we have, we have once a month, nights of worship, I preached out of Ephesians chapter 6. All the passages leading up to what I'm going to read to you in just a moment here. It's all the armor. It's, it's putting on the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the, the shield of faith, and to put these things on to fight the battle. But then it says, and then take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take up the Scriptures, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, so you can fight the enemy. And then it says this in verse 18 of Ephesians 6. And pray in the Spirit on, what does it say? Next two words, what? All occasions and with, what does it say? All kinds of prayers. I mean, listen to that. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, the Apostle Paul says, pray for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will be fearless. So I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Twice that word fearless comes up. He says, pray for me that I would be bold, that I would be fearless. Are we praying for the power of God, for the presence of God, for the work of God? Are we praying for spiritual power, protection, and victory? And I want to give you a simple challenge that for some of you, you've never done this, some of you have. But here's the challenge. Prayer challenge. Learn to prayer walk. Learn to prayer walk. Learn to actually walk around places and pray while you're walking as you're looking around, seeing what's going on. You can pray quietly inside. If you're other people, you can pray out loud, just you know, kind of quietly out loud. But learn to prayer walk. There's a, there, there's a woman, Emma Jereen Burgess. When I first came to serve the church I served in Michigan, uh, I, I had an office that had kind of windows facing towards the back of the property. And there was a you know, large parking lot that kind of wove through the back of the parking lot area there in the back of the property. And this woman, Emma Jereen Burgess, lived kind of kitty corner from the church. And probably five days a week, she would come over and she would walk around the boundaries of the entire church. Like four, five, six times, she'd walk around there. And I thought she was exercising, you know. 
And she'd walk around, walk around, she'd go home again. So after I, a few weeks later, I kind of saw her and I got to know who she was. And, and I said, Emma Drina, what a neat thing that you have the church so nearby so you can exercise. <laughs> and she says, well, I'm getting exercise, I guess, but that's not really why I'm there. I'm there to pray. She was pray- I said, so I asked her questions. I said, well, tell me what you're doing. She said, well, I just, she said, I just walk around the parameters of the church's property and I pray that God will keep bad stuff out and that God will bring people who need Jesus in. And I thought, what an example. I mean, what a passion. And that, she did that for years and years until her health wouldn't really let her do that anymore. But she prayer walked and prayer walked and prayer walked. And she was part of a group of a number of, of these women who just prayed passionately. They would say that Sherry and I, we pray every day for you two and we pray for each of your kids by name every single day. I actually think that there's gonna be things I'll learn someday in heaven, all kinds of stuff that didn't come our way and bad things that could have happened that didn't because these women prayed. I really believe that. So what if we, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, on our base, you know, in, 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 our, in our homes, where, wherever God puts us, on our schools, on our campuses, what if we made it a point of praying while we're walking around? And I'm not, we talk about organic Irish. I'm not talking about like going, glory to God, I'm praying for these evil people. And don't, don't, that's not organic. You're going to freak people out, right? Don't do that. Just, just walk and pray quietly. If you're with someone else, pray quietly out loud so you can agree with each other in prayer. And just walk and pray and pray and walk and see what God does. If you've never tried prayer walking, it's really, there's something about walking, your eyes are open, you're seeing what's going on around you, and you're just kind of quietly praying in your heart. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to prayer walk right now. You stay seated, I'll walk around, okay? <laughs> and as I prayer walk, I'm going to give you permission to keep your eyes open. You don't have to bow your heads. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't even have to fold your hands because the Bible never says to close your eyes. That's for kids so they won't be distracted. The Bible never says to fold your hands. That's so kids won't poke your neighbor. So if you promise not to poke your neighbor, okay, while we're praying, you don't have to fold your hands, you don't have to close your eyes, and I want to pray for 2500 Garden Road, this place that God has put us, and for our neighbors. And I can do this walking around our property, walking up and down Garden Road. I'm going to do it for now right here. So I'm going to pray, and you can pray along with me in your hearts. Keep your eyes open. So to walk on, say, God, I pray right now for... Shoreline Church and our influence right here in this neighborhood. You've, God, you put us here over seven years ago. You opened the doors in this strange little property in this, this building that used to be full of racks of dog food and other things that was never meant to be a church. But God, you put us here. And then you put us with these neighbors who we're reaching out to through our lunches and through our cafe. Lord, we pray for our cafe. We pray for Rita as she leads that as a volunteer with for all of her volunteers. We pray you'd raise up new baristas and new volunteers too and that that cafe would be a place to serve our neighbors right here in the neighborhood. We thank you, God, that, that we're building friendships and relationships and even some partnerships with our neighbors. And we pray you'll continue to use Sherlin right here in this unique place you've placed us because, God, we believe you're here. We're here because of your leading and your hand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you can walk around and you can pray silently, quietly with someone else like it's a conversation. But that's another way you can begin praying and, and lifting those things up. And then number five, prayer with people who are not yet followers of Jesus. I want to challenge you to start praying with people. And here's the thing. If you won't pray out loud with Christians, you probably won't have a hard time doing this. So start practicing with Christians. Okay, start there. Start saying to other Christians, let's pray together often so you can get used to praying out loud. If praying out loud makes you nervous, first practice with Christians because I want to challenge you to pray for and with non-Christians. You say, well, how does that work? I mean, you can't, non-Christians aren't going to pray with me. And all I would say to you is, in many cases, yes, they will. They'll let you pray with them. I was talking with a, a guy from our church here, and we were at a dinner, and we were just talking about ministry and life and stuff, and he was asking questions about me, and I was asking questions about him, and he was telling me about his work. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I work in a setting. It's not a Christian setting, and my, my boss is not a Christian, so I really, I'm a, they know I'm a Christian, but I don't really talk about my faith, or I really don't have any way to live out my faith in my work setting, because it's a very, it's just not a Christian setting. And I said to him, well, have you ever tried praying with the people you work with or praying with your boss? And he said, well, I just told you, they're not Christians. I said, I understand that, but have you ever prayed with them? And he's like, I don't really know what you're talking about. And I said, well, I said, I said like your boss, you told me about your boss a little bit, and it's, I could tell that they were friends, they had a good relationship. And I said, so I said, if your boss, would he ever share with you like a struggle in his life or something great that's happening? He's like, oh yeah, we talk about life and stuff. I said, so, so you're telling me if you're talking with your boss and he shares like a real great news that happened or something really hard that happened in his life. I said, what do you think he would say if you just looked at him and said, 
you know, would it be okay if I just took a moment and just, you know, I don't know if you believe in the whole prayer thing, but I really do. Can I take a moment and say a prayer for you? What do you think he would say? And he's like, I don't know. I said, well, try it sometime. About a week later, I get an email from this guy. It worked. <clears throat> and he tells me the story. He says, yeah, I was talking with my boss. And I, and I don't even, this is, I don't even remember all the details. He just said, I was talking with my boss, and I think it was, I think it was some, like a need that came up with one of his grandkids or something, not, something, something like that, where he said, I was talking with my boss, and he shared with me something going on with one of his grandkids and something they were going through that was kind of tough. And I felt like I was supposed to say to him, would you mind if I just took a moment and said a prayer for your grandchild? So he said, so I did. And he said, yes. And I prayed for him. And afterwards, he said, thank you so much. In that relationship, the boss, after that, started asking him to pray for different things and open up the door for some conversation about Jesus and about faith. When you're interacting with somebody in your family, a friend, they don't have to be a Christian, but you're interacting with somebody who, who, who just shares this really wonderful news or this really tough, painful situation, and you feel the Holy Spirit nudge you, offer to pray. So somebody says to you, yeah, you know, I just, uh, I just became a, you know, a grandpa for the first time. Here's a picture of my little granddaughter. And if you look at them and said, you know what? You know, I don't know if you even do the whole prayer thing, but that's really important to me. Can I just say a prayer for your granddaughter right now? And a prayer for you just to be a great grandpa for her? And the worst someone's going to say in a moment like that, the worst they're going to say is, no, thanks, that's not my thing. That's probably the worst you're going to get. But what they'll probably say is, yeah, I'd like that. And when you pray, God shows up. God's present. I can tell you how many times I've prayed with people, not Christians, prayed with people who are not Christians, and after I prayed, they thank me, and there's men and women, tears in their eyes. I think that's because the Holy Spirit's showing up, and God's starting to move in their heart, and they feel something they don't even understand, but God is coming near to that time of prayer. What, what, if, what if this next week, all of us had a moment where we asked someone, could I just say a prayer for that? And a few of us would get a no thank you, but most of us, this has been my experience for the years, most of us will get a, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. My dad... I prayed for him many times. My dad still never told me no when I've asked him to pray. My dad's not yet, yet a follower of Jesus. And, and my dad will say, you know, I'll, I'll say, Dad, can I pray for that? And this is often his response. He goes, he goes couldn't hurt. <laughs> That's what he says. Couldn't hurt. So I pray. And God shows up. And God moves. And that can happen for you also. And so I, I want to challenge you. And, and, and so, so here's the prayer challenge. And when you, I want to give you a little bit of coaching on how to pray with somebody who's not a Christian. So, you, so you're sensitive to how you pray. If you're a note taker, there's room in your outline there to write some thoughts down. I think a number of these things are written in your outline there. But here's some ideas. First, would it be okay if I said a quick prayer for you right now? Get permission. So somebody says, I'm going through a tough time. Don't just like lay hands on them and start praying for them. Don't do that. You know, that's not organic. That's kind of creepy. And so don't do that. But if somebody shares a need or a joy, just say, would it be okay if I said a prayer for you? And if they say yes, then you pray for them. Also, the next thing you see there is be fine either way. If somebody says, oh, no, thanks. That's not my thing. Just say, oh, no problem at all. But the thing you know is you can quietly pray in your heart anyways. You're still going to pray, right? You're just not going to pray out loud with them, but you're still going to pray. Now, some coaching. Please hear these things. Next, be brief. Prayer warriors, be brief. I mean 15, 20 seconds brief, not 5, 10 minutes brief. Uh, some of you are really great prayers, but you can pray long. And if someone's not a believer and you say, can I pray, be brief, okay? Next thing, speak common language. If you speak Spanish, speak common Spanish. If you speak English, speak common English. If you do sign language, speak common sign language. Don't, um, don't go all thee, thee and thou, King James, Middle English on them, Okay. <laughs> Because it'll just creep them out, and it should, because you don't talk that way normally, and all of a sudden you're these, thee and thouing, and it's going to be, they're not going to know what you're talking about. So just talk to God like a friend, right? Don't, and and if, you're, if you're more energetic in your prayers, don't go super glory to God, praise Jesus, hallelujah on them either. Just talk to God about what they've shared with you. And so, so keep, use common language, all right? Also, uh, extend a hand when appropriate. When appropriate. When my mom was still living, I would often ask her, Mom, can I pray for you about that? And she'd always kind of think about it. And she'd say, well, I think, yeah, I think I'd like that. And I would often just take her hand and pray for her. Almost every time I prayed for my mom, there were tears in her eyes after I prayed. And I thought, Mom, you're sensing something here. Be open to this. But, but just when it's appropriate, take a hand, connect in that way. 
Next thing, lift up the specific need or joy that they've shared and no extra stuff. So somebody asks you to pray, you know, they're going to have surgery on their hip. So you, Lord, I want to pray for their hip. I want to pray that you'd heal it, that you'd help them, give them patience going through the surgery and give them strength. And, and then don't, don't like to, and, Lord, and then Lord, I just want to thank you that the 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and was born in a manger. I thank you for that. And I thank you that he lived a life with no sin. Don't take him through the, and then he died on the cross and he rose again and he ascended. And don't, don't give him the gospel in your prayer. Because that's just, that's not what you asked them if you could do. You got permission to say a prayer for them. So say the prayer, and, and then after you've prayed, without putting a bunch of extra stuff into it, um, pray in the name of Jesus. And I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. And just pray in the name of Jesus, and then expect the Spirit of God to show up. Expect that God's going to be present as you pray. Turn into the location and the volume. If you're in a kind of a public setting, you can even say, you know what? We don't even have to close our eyes. You know, just let me just say a quick prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for this person and this great joy they've experienced and for the birth of their grandchild or the raise they got or their new job they got. And I pray you bless them in that job and let them know that you love them and you care about them. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't even have to close your eyes, but keep it simple. Think about your setting, right? And then follow up and check in as you can. So if, if they share something wonderful or need a week or two later, say, hey, how's that going? And, and, and you know, what's happening there? And then leave it in the hands of God. After you've prayed, after you've talked to them, then you say, now God, just at that point in your own heart, say, God, I entrust this to you. Because God does what only he can do. And God answers prayer. And here's the kind of, this is kind of the neat thing. As you start praying for people who aren't yet followers of Jesus, a couple things will start to happen. Some of them will start coming to you, asking you to pray for other things without you even instigating it. Because they know you pray. And, and sometimes what's going to happen is you're going to pray about something and God's going to work and God's going to show up and do something amazing and answer to that prayer. And they're going to come to you and they're going to say, you know, you prayed about that thing and then this happened. Do you think that maybe that happened because you prayed about it? And you look at them and you say, I know and believe in a God who answers prayer and who cares about his children. Yes, I believe God's at work in your life. And that may open their heart to that, may open their heart to the next step of knowing who Jesus is. But we're going to level up our prayer lives. We're going to say, God, give me courage to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, today, let this day be a mission trip. Let me be your missionary. We're, we're, we're going to notice. We're going to open our eyes. We're going to pray together with those who are close to Jesus, for those who are far from Jesus. We're going to pray for churches as we drive by them. You could pray before you get out of bed in the morning. If you, if you live anywhere around a church, when you're driving by, you can see a church and you can pray for that and you can pray for the people in your community that don't know Jesus while you're, you know, before you get to work or before you get to the store, or before you do your first thing in the morning. You can say, man, it's already only 8.30. I've already prayed three times then do some bonus prayers. Level up. Amen? Now we're going to close in prayer. You may close your eyes and fold your hands if you'd like to. You may keep your hands open and keep your eyes open, but let's pray. Lord, thank you for Shoreline Church. Thank you for the privilege we have to pray that in the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus, you invite us in. You hear our prayers. You answer our prayers. And thank you, God, that, that we can do our part and we can love and care and serve and share. But when it partners with the power of heaven through prayer, lives are changed. Lord, use Shoreline Church. God, I pray that th the next 30 days, over a quarter million prayers will be lifted and more because, God, we're leveling up our prayer life. We're partnering with you in this great wor work of sharing the love of Jesus with our community and the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen, Amen means so be it. We agree. I want to hand off our venues to their venue pastors. They'll share a few things with you.